I'm happy to go, but you can go too. Not a good book. Do you want to go? Yeah. Um, I want to, yeah, I want to talk about, the thing that's on my mind is, um, is uh, climate change as a threat to global development. And again, that sounds cliche, but with the Paris meetings that have been going on, it's certainly been on my mind. I've also been doing research on it and been thinking a lot about it. And um, I think the thing that's been um, challenging a bit as a researcher is just sort of the more, the more we've looked at data, the more we've, we've analyzed the problem and, and, and tried to figure out what the implications of climate change could be for global poverty, the worse the, the picture looks. And, and that's been something that's been really, uh, you know, very difficult. Um, social scientists have a, a role to play in this. You know, there's sort of like different steps that lead from CO2 emissions to global poverty. Um, you know, there's the, how the emissions affect the atmosphere and how those changes in the atmosphere affect temperature and the temperature may affect economic activity in you know, various ways. It may affect different economic activities differently. So it's a pretty complex complex system. What we've been doing in some recent research is, is very much focusing on that last step, you know, from temperature changes to outcome, economic outcomes, political outcomes. And, um, of course, people had thought about this before. There's economists and others who had studied the issue before, but with pretty minimal data for the most part. Just in the last few years, there's some studies on it, but they had, economists, climate economists, environmental economists had made assumptions about how, you know, two degrees Celsius warming, three degrees, four degrees Celsius warming, might affect the economy. The impacts that we're estimating in data we've looked at are an order of magnitude higher than those existing estimates. You know, they, they kind of estimated that the, if the world warms by three or four degrees Celsius, maybe global output will fall 5%, <laughs> you know, or 3%. Like tiny effects, these minimal effects. And those are, you know, there are these... Um, called integrated assessment models, IAMs. And they're, they're really just pulling data out of the air. I mean, I think they would even <laughs> acknowledge that they're kind of made up data. They're really old, a lot of them. Some are newer, but... And we're finding that, you know, in, in the latest estimates with, with my co-authors, Solomon Shang and, and Marshall Burke, we're finding that aver- our best guess is in the next 60, 70 years, um, global GDP would fall by about a quarter due to climate change, with our best guesses about what climate change is going to look like. Global GDP is going to... So just huge effects that are, that are, that are really large. And, and um, the, the implications of this are, are really important for, for global poverty for a couple of reasons. Two, at least. One, what we're finding when we, we look at these relationships is increasing temperature has a different effect depending on whether you start out cool or warm as a country. That makes total sense. So like our, the models predict that if you're Canada or Norway, some northern country, a little bit of warming is actually really good. You know, there's more arable land, you know, you don't have to spend as much on heating bills, whatever. There's all these benefits. Those guys are probably going to grow faster. So some of the rich northern countries, if anything, as the world warms, are going to get richer. The poorest countries that, sat, that start out hot are going to be really, really hurt. So what we're finding is this negative effect of increasing temperature gets even more pronounced when you start out hot. And, and that makes a lot of sense too. You know, agriculture can be supported up to certain temperatures, but when you get really hot and really dry, yields fall off really, really quickly. So for a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia in particular, three or four degrees Celsius warming is just catastrophic uh, for agriculture. And, um, and then the latest data, and this is where it just keeps getting worse and worse. And I just want to share with you guys why I'm so worried about it. I think this is such a, such a major issue to, to think about. Even outside of agriculture, there's more and more evidence that labor productivity falls at high temperatures. So there's some recent studies looking at Indian factory workers. Indian factory workers do not work in an air-conditioned environment. Like This isn't a beautifully controlled thing at 65 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. It's hot as hell in the factory. So when it's hotter outside, they're hotter, they're sweatier, and their labor productivity falls as well. Um, that's even true in the U.S. For workers who work outside, who have you know, manual labor jobs and whatnot, when it gets hot, their labor productivity falls too. So we have these agricultural effects, we have these non-agricultural effects. The effects are particularly bad in hot countries. So the poorest regions of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, are going to lose the most. Their GDPs could fall a lot, even more than by a quarter. And some of the richest areas of the world in the global north are going to get richer or kind of stay the same. So we're staring, staring at this world, you know, 60, 70, 80 years from now, where, you know, global GDP is, is falling, inequality is growing. Um, it's incredibly bleak. 
It's incredibly bleak. So that's what the, that's kind of like the research I've been working on over the last uh, few months. Again, with you know huge props to my co-authors who who really took the lead on this particular project. We, I'd worked with them before, looking at the implications for political instability uh, of rising temperatures, and those are really bleak too. So not surprisingly, when the economy collapses, the increase uh, there's an increased risk of civil war and violence and crime and sort of social instability as well. So so you know these are two papers that both have these broad findings on climate change and the economy, climate change and, um, and politics. And in all the data we've put together, the impacts on poor countries are going to be particularly bad for Africa and South Asia. So we're, we're really staring at this bleak, unfair world. And, and the thing that upsets me, like just makes me physically ill to think about, uh, is all the CO2 that's being pumped up in the atmosphere, it isn't being pumped up by people in sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's not. They didn't cause climate change. Like, we cause climate change in the U.S., Europe, now China. It's like the wealthier parts of the world that are poisoning the atmosphere, leading to these temperature increases. But the price is going to be paid in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia in particular. And just the, the profound... You talked about in the beginning of this, you know, climate change and justice and, and sort of climate justice. Like, the... The, the injustice of, of what's what's going down right now is so severe. Um, it's it's heartbreaking. It's actually really heartbreaking. So the, anyway, the more data we look at, the more research we do, the worse the picture looks. Looks here. It's it's uh, it's just really bleak. How would you? I have like a bunch of questions and like thoughts on that, on what you, everything you said. Um, but one of them is how do you take you're you're taking one variable it seems which is climate change and you're ascribing like ginormous reaction to it what about when you have i feel like the biggest like biggest change agents are the things that you don't end up like you don't end up foreseeing like you don't predict it like the things that you can graph it's like the outliers that really hmm. that's that's something that i've just noticed when just looking at trends in history is like we predict we predict and then it's like boom something nobody could have ever foreseen yeah. changes the whole deal so, how, yeah. you know, how do you Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the outlier that would be great, or the, the, the thing that we can't predict that would be great, would be some kind of technological adaptation to higher temperatures. If, you know, whenever we've discussed these results, or whenever these issues come into public policy debate, there's an argument, well, you know, we'll innovate our way out of it. You know, we've innovated our way out of a lot of stuff. There's so much innovation going on. We just need the right energy technologies, we need the right adaptation, the right agricultural technology, then we can adapt our way out of it. So that would be an amazing technological innovation that could help. But will I, that happen? I don't know. I think uh, I've, um, Sam's a good friend of mine. And so, so I've talked with Sam about this. He, he kind of gave me the idea for it. It's that, you know, yes, you could come up with brilliant innovations that'll make that'll make that big change. But maybe the big change is in something, I mean, it's probably gonna be something we literally cannot predict, but um, maybe it's not necessarily in technology. Maybe it's in like spirituality or in people's actual view of social justice, or maybe the technology will catalyze people to be able to, us, <laughs> we're talking about ourselves here, to the people who are screwing over the people in Sub-Saharan Africa to actually be able to face it. And I wonder what, what will be that catalyst of change? Will that be a person? Will that be a... I don't know. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think the we were talking about empathy before, and I think there's too little empathy about this problem. I don't think there's there's perfect understanding of it. Um, the some of the, the fear is in some ways it's already too late. Like we've already pumped so much CO2 into the atmosphere, we're going to continue warming for some time to come. So we've already done damage that's going to be really hard to undo. But you know, two degrees Celsius maybe we can manage. Four or five degrees Celsius increase is just a whole other ball game. Then you really get out to that region of very high temperatures where, where things can sort of fall off the cliff. I, I was discussing this with, with a friend of mine, an economist, I was giving a talk and he said, well, if it gets really hot in Africa, and it gets nicer you know, to live in Russia, we can uh, you know, just move hundreds of millions of people up to Siberia. You know, like people come up with these ideas, but I don't know what the practicalities of that are. <laughs> work out. Yeah, I mean, think about the challenges there. So it's pretty wild. So I mean, that that's the thing that's really on my mind. I, I don't have the solution. You guys said, what are, what's the solution to global poverty? One solution would be major investments in clean energy and reduce CO two emissions, 
in the rich countries. I mean, China and India in particular, I mean, India is a funny case because India is polluting a lot and they're actually contributing more and more to global CO2 emissions. But they're also going to suffer a lot, you know, from it. Parts of China will also suffer from warming, but they're a bit farther north and, you know, parts of them won't suffer as much. But, um, yeah, if we could reduce CO2 emissions massively in the next decade, it could make a huge difference for billions of people's lives going forward. And I, I don't think people frame it I don't know. In the U.S. political debate, the U.S. political debate is so strange on this issue because people haven't even acknowledged that there's a problem. So right. that's it's the first step in recovery, right? Is to actually acknowledge the problem. And, uh, <laughs> hey, <everywhere>. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right. At least like in the EU and Japan, when like people are kind of aware there's a problem, they, they may not have the heart, or the stomach to deal with it. But um, that that's what's on my mind. That's what's worrying me a lot uh, these days, Martin. <laughs> it's, Good. 